is worthy indeed. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you, Claudia, for reminding us of that. Well, last time we were together, we saw how Israel sinned against God by serving more false gods than they had ever served before. And this caused Israel to become oppressed by not one, but two different enemies. The people of Ammon from the east and the Philistines from the southwest. And so caught in the middle of this pincer movement, the children of Israel cry out to the Lord and they finally repent of their sins. And therefore the Lord began sending various judges to slowly but surely deliver the nation. And after the judgeships of Jephthah, Ibsan, and Elon, for the first time in 18 years, the people of Ammon were finally no longer a threat. <clears throat> Unfortunately, the Philistines continued to be a problem and were a problem that whole time. Indeed, the Lord stated in Judges 13.1, which we looked at last week, that the Philistines would continue to be an issue for 22 more years, for a total of 40. And at the beginning of those 40 years, though, the angel, or the messenger of the Lord, who we saw last week is none other than Jesus Christ himself, visited the wife of a man named Manoah from the tribe of Dan. And Jesus told her that despite her previous inability to have children, she would now have a son. And not just any son, as he would become the strongest man who has ever lived. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Judges. We're going to be in Judges chapter 13 again today. Our focus is going to be on verses 4 through 14. But I do want to reread verses 1 through 3 just to give us an idea of where we were before. So Judges chapter 13, I'm looking specifically at verses 4 through 14, but I'm going to read verse 1 through 14. So this is God's holy, authoritative, inspired, and inerrant word. Let's read it together. Judges chapter 13, starting in verse 1. Again. The children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, there was a certain man from Zerah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and had no children. And the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, Indeed, now... You are barren and have borne no children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. Now, therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or similar drink and not to eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive and bear a son and no razor shall come upon his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. So the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his countenance was like the countenance of the angel of God. He, very awesome. But I did not ask him where he was from, and he did not tell me his name. And he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. Now drink no wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, O oh my Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent to us again, uh, whom you, you sent come to us again, and teach us what we shall do for this child who will be born. And God listened to the voice of Manoah. 
And the angel of God came to the woman again as she was sitting in the field. But Manoah, her husband, was not with her. Then the woman ran in haste and told her husband and said to him, Look, the man who came to me the other day has just now appeared to me. So Manoah arose and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said to him, Are, are you the man who spoke to this woman? And he said, I am. Manoah said, Now let your words come to pass. What will be the boy's rule of life and, and his work? So the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat anything that comes from the vine, nor may she drink wine or similar drink, nor eat anything unclean. All that I commanded her, let her observe. This is the word of the Lord through the prophet Samuel. <clears throat> so after this announcement that Manoah's wife would conceive and bear a son, Judges chapter 13 verses 4 through 5 contains a series of instructions pointing to this child's unique nature. Uh, in fact, these instructions are based on what's called the Nazarite vow. Uh, in Hebrew, this word Nazarite carries the meaning of both separating from the world and dedicating yourself to God. It means both things. And so the full instructions, though, for the Nazarite vow are found in Numbers chapter 6, verses 1 through 21. I'm not going to read that all, but just to give a quick summary, those who take the Nazarite vow are forbidden from consuming wine or anything else alcoholic, as well as even non-alcoholic grape products such as raisins, grape juice, or even grapes themselves. So that's one thing. Second thing is Nazarites are not to cut their hair. And third, Nazarites were not allowed to touch a dead body, even if it was one of a close relative. Those are the three things that sets a Nazarite apart from the world and dedicated to God. Now normally, normally, the Nazarite vow was a temporary one. Uh, for example, the Apostle Paul appears to have taken a temporary Nazarite vow in Acts chapter 18, verse 18. However, there are three special cases mentioned in the Bible in which the Nazarite vow, instead of being temporary, was intended to last for a lifetime. Samson was the first. Not much later, Samuel in 1 Samuel 1.11 will be the second. And then John the Baptist appears to have been a lifetime Nazarite and the third one to do so, according to Luke 1.15. So because we're familiar with those three, we often think, well, they were Nazarites their whole life. Yes, those three were, but for most people, it was not a lifetime thing. It was just a lifetime thing for those three. However, in Samson's case, Judges 13, verses 4 through 5, says that his mother is to start observing the Nazarite vow from now until Samson's birth so that he will be a Nazarite from the womb or from conception. So not just since he was born, but since he was conceived, he would be a Nazarite. Of course, this points to the fact that not just Samson, but all human beings have both life and a purpose from the womb or from conception. And yet, even after Roe versus Wade was overturned on June the 24th, the lies of the left have not only continued, they have actually become more blatant. I don't know if you've noticed. Uh, however, this is not completely unexpected because without any other rational arguments, all the left has left are lies. That's really all they got. And, but they spread them freely, as if the overruling 
of Roe versus Wade would somehow lead to more death. That's what they're saying. Even though Roe versus Wade itself led to the deaths of over 60 million. It's almost hard to comprehend the level of evil coming out of the mouths of certain politicians, activists, and big businesses who really should know better given their stated devotions to human rights and science. Because it doesn't matter how loud you scream, my body, my choice. It doesn't matter when you're dealing with a different body, the body of an unborn human being with unique human DNA. In our text, Samson is devoted to God from the womb. He's devoted to God from conception which points to unique personhood starting at conception. Like the prophet Jeremiah, Samson is also called from the womb. He's given life. He's given purpose from the very start. By the way, so are each and every one of you, all of us. All of us are called to love the Lord our God with everything we've got and to love our neighbor as ourselves. This is what Jesus taught us. However, some, like Samson, are called to be even more specific things. What's Samson's purpose? Look at the end of Judges 13.5. It tells us right there. He shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. That's really interesting. I don't know about you, but that really just, when I, when I was studying for this sermon, really bounced off the page at me because it's a little bit unexpected. Because it, what we would expect is he shall deliver Israel out of the hands of the Philistines. But that's not what it says. It says he shall begin to deliver Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Just begin it, not finish it. It's a little weird. Jumps off the page at you. Um, it's unexpected. Again, look back at Judges 13.1. We're at a time when the 40 years of Philistine oppression has just started. God said it's in the last 40 years, but it's just started. And the person that God will use to begin to deliver or begin to save Israel from the Philistines not only hasn't been born yet, he hasn't even been conceived yet. And in light of what we've just been talking about with abortion, it gives new meaning to the question, has Abortion killed the person who would have already found the cure to cancer had they lived. Uh, uh, if so, how much longer do we have to wait? Because Israel has to wait here. The one who's going to begin to save them hasn't even been conceived yet. As we will see in the coming weeks, they had to wait at least 18 years, at least 18 years, before Samson was old enough to do anything. But even after Samson grows up, God says he's only going to begin to save Israel from the Philistines. Samson will not finish the job. Instead, the Bible tells us that the ending of this 40 years of Philistine oppression will not come until the time of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 7. But even then, and Samson be, and, and, I'm sorry, Samuel beats them, stops them, and there's peace for a little while, but it's not lasting because the Philistines come back. They rebound during the reign of King Saul. They start causing problems again. And it will take Saul's successor, King David, to finally bring lasting peace with the Philistines, a peace achieved through strength, as Benjamin Netanyahu says. So Samson only starts the job. Why is this? 
It's almost as if, and I would argue this is the case, that Jesus is telling us ahead of time that while Samson will indeed be special and do a lot of great things, his flaws will keep him from finishing the job. And this is because as special as Samson is, he's still human. He's still under the curse of sin. And the Bible tells us about several particularly special births. Uh, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Samson, Samuel, John the Baptist, just to name a few. But as great as all of those people were, they're still just men. Still sinful. They still died. And therefore, in order to save people from sin and the death that follows it, what we need, what you and I need, is the most special birth of all. Yes. We need the birth of someone who is not only a man, but is also God. We need the sinless Jesus Christ to die our death so that you and I may live forever. And so Christ's announcement about Samson's birth here in Judges chapter 13 is really designed to make us look forward to Christ's coming. After Jesus tells Manoah's wife that she will have a son, she goes and tells her husband in, in Judges 13, 6 through 7. And first, she describes the angel of the Lord, who is, again, an Old Testament appearance of Jesus Christ. She describes him as a, quote, unquote, man of God. Now, that term is normally re reserved for prophets. However, she quickly adds that his appearance is like an angel of God, or the angel of God, depending on your translation. Uh, the phrase, an angel of God, is a bit more accurate, not just because of the Hebrew text, but because at this point, Manoah's wife doesn't yet realize that this is actually the Son of God appearing to her as an angel. She doesn't know that yet. That won't happen until near the end of the chapter, which Lord willing, we'll look at next week. But one thing is clear to Manoah's wife, this person cannot be an ordinary man because his appearance, she says, was awesome. It was awesome. With awesome in this case meaning fearful or even terrifying. Uh, by the way, uh, this is typical uh, for all angels, uh, not just the angel of the Lord, uh, because whenever human beings uh, in uh, the Bible uh, encounter angels uh, for the first time their reaction is not to say oh how beautiful or oh how cute that is not their first reaction instead their first reaction is usually terror usually uh, uh, as I have demonstrated in a study many years ago angels can actually take several different forms uh, but even when they appear human which is what they most often do even then, most of the time they're intimidating. Most of the time, not all the time. Uh, but because of this, Judges 13.6 says Manoah's wife didn't feel comfortable asking who this person was or where he was from. Instead, in verse 7, she just gives her husband a partial report on what was said, how she would now have a son, but he was to be a Nazarite from conception. Manoah's wife doesn't even mention the purpose for which God will give this child, at least not here. And yet the instructions here from verse 4 that she does repeat here in verse 7 uh, also include this, uh, she's not supposed to eat anything unclean. Not supposed to eat anything unclean. Now, from what I could tell during my studies, People are really divided over what that is. Um, does this refer to uh, non-alcoholic grape products also being unclean for Nazarites? Is it talking about that? That's one possibility. Or does this refer to unclean meats like pork? Uh, as uh, stated in Leviticus chapter 11 or, Levit or Deuteronomy chapter 14. 
It's difficult to say which one, uh, because the eating of unclean meats was forbidden for all Jews, not just the Nazarites, uh, under Old Testament ceremonial law. However, archaeological excavations from the Judges period show that there were Israelites raising and eating pigs, because we find pig bones in places where we wouldn't expect to find pig bones. Uh, and so it shows that Israel was sinning in that way during this time. Uh, on the other hand, while the consuming of non-alcoholic grape products is clearly forbidden for Nazarites in number 6, 3 through 4, those products are never called unclean anywhere else outside of possibly here in Judges 13. And so it's difficult to say what was meant, but Manoah's wife knew what was meant. So we can just, she knew what it meant. It doesn't matter if we don't, but she knew. Uh, however, after hearing this partial report from his wife, Manoah himself wonders, okay, is there anything else we need to know about this? Because we haven't, had been able to, haven't been able to have kids before. Now we're going to have one. Uh, and I'm going to be a new daddy. What do I need to do? Because uh, I haven't done this before. And so Manoah, in Judges 13a, prays. He prays. He talks to God. He asks God, can you please send your divine messenger again? Just give us some more clarification here. And notice that even though God didn't have to, because it wasn't necessary, God graciously grants Manoah's request as God sends his divine messenger once again while Manoah's wife is sitting alone in a field in verse 9. Let's think about that for a minute. It's worth thinking about. You know, when we pray, when we talk to God, and we ask him things, whoops, uh, he always answers in one of three ways, okay? He either says yes, or he says no, or he says wait. I had a pastor growing up who added a fourth thing. He's, he got, sometimes God says, you've got to be kidding. But we're just going to leave that one. So, uh, but yes, no, or wait. That's how he answers our prayers. In the case of Manoah's prayer, God has already revealed everything Manoah and his wife need to know. He's told them everything they need to know. And so in that case, there's really no need for God to send his messenger again. And yet, when Manoah prays and he asks God, send your messenger again, God doesn't say no. He very easily could have said no, but he doesn't say no. Instead, Yes. He graciously sends his messenger again. Why? Just because Manoah asked. Keep that in mind when you pray. Don't treat God like a genie, because he's not a genie. But don't think of God as stingy either. Instead, pray with 1 John chapter 5, verses 14 through 15 in mind. It says, now this is the confidence we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Keep that in mind when you pray. God answers prayer. Prayer really does make a difference. Because when Manoah's wife sees that God the Father answered her husband's prayer by sending his divine messenger again, even though he didn't have to, she runs and goes and gets her husband. No, that's just that funny. Manoah, he wants to see this guy. Because only his wife got to see him the first time. He didn't get to see, her, to see the messenger. So he asked for the messenger to come. Messenger comes back, but only to Manoah's wife. She's by herself. He's not around. Isn't that funny? It's almost like God has a sense of humor. You know, it's like Manoah's the one who wants to see him, and he goes to his wife again. Uh, but he does stick around. She's like, can you stay here while I go get my husband? And he stays. And then she goes and gets her husband. Come back. Um, in Judges 13, 9 through 10. And yet this time, 
when Manoah and his wife get there, neither one seems to be intimidated like uh, his wife was the first time uh, because they both simply address this messenger as a man. But again, as we saw last week, and we'll see this also next week too, this messenger is clearly none other than Jesus Christ himself has to be. But perhaps he is now toning down his glorious appearance like he will often do later in the New Testament uh, outside of examples like the Transfiguration. But in, in verse 11, Manoah now asks this messenger, Are you the man who spoke to this woman? To which Jesus replies, I. Now most translations say I am. But you'll notice that in this case, am is in italics, which in this case means that it doesn't appear in Hebrew. It was just added later to sound better in English. And so Jesus isn't giving away his true identity as the great I am quite yet. He will in a minute. But at first he just says in the Hebrew, I. That's all he says. Um, uh, he, he, he says as little as possible at first. For example, when Manoah asks how the child should be raised and what he should do in Judges 13, 12, in verses 13 and 14, Jesus just summarizes what he told Manoah's wife earlier in the passage, although he leaves out the child's mission. Uh, uh, is this kept secret for a time and only known to Manoah's wife? Uh, it's possible. Uh, but Jesus does say, at the end of verse 14, all that I commanded her, let her observe. Again, this is why God the Father's answering in Manoah's prayer to send his messenger for a second time is a little surprising. Because honestly, there wasn't anything more to be said. He just repeats what he said before, and he doesn't even say everything that he said before. And yet, the reason why we're told about all this is because we need, you and I need to understand here that God is gracious. He's being gracious. He's showing grace. He understands Manoah's insecurities. And if God understands Manoah's insecurities, do you think he understands yours and mine as well? You better believe he does. Oh, yes, he does. He understands our insecurities. God also understands that as sinful human beings, we need saving. We need saving from a lot of things. Israel has sinned and subsequently needs to be saved from the Philistines. You and I have also sinned. Samson will begin to save Israel from the Philistines, but then death will take him. Before he finishes. Samuel will finish the job, but the Philistines will eventually come back because sin has a tendency, as we know, to persist. And as sin persists, death persists also. And therefore, what you and I really need is someone who's strong enough beat sin and death itself. Not just strong enough to beat the Philistines, strong enough to beat sin and death itself. Samson and Samuel can't do that. Indeed, none can. Except for Jesus Christ. Have you given your life to the only one who can save completely? 